Well, I hope your weekend is going off to a good start. I have something a little different for you today. It's a continuation of sorts of my series on modernism, this one focusing on the new mass and how we got the new mass. You may have heard of the liturgical movement, not to be confused with the new liturgical movement, which is a website and, an or, and, an, and a sort of a organization and a, and a movement of Catholic faithful, of traditionalists seeking to restore the traditional liturgy to the church. The original liturgical movement began as something good, and then it was twisted into something very different and used to bring us the new Mass. What I have for you today is Michael Davies explaining how that happened, and he's doing it in the form of a book review. And he gives a critical review of the book, which is the liturgical movement Garnje to Baudin to Bugnini, Roots, Radicals, and Results, originally published in 1980. I can give you a link to the Amazon listing for it, but it's been out of print for a while. It's published by most recently by Angelus Press. You might be able to find a copy of it somewhere floating around the internet. Maybe, you know, this video gets enough views, maybe somebody over there will notice and decide to reprint it, and that'd be great. So, Davies explains how this happened, and he does so in the form of a review, and there's a lot of things here that are going to be hard for some people to hear. But, to understand how we got to where we are in the church, things like this are important. So, Without further ado, I'll let Michael Davies explain the rest for you, at least my reading of him. And apologies in advance for some of the butchering of some of these names. I couldn't find a pronunciation guide for some of these online. And you don't need to correct them in there because I may never say them again. Anyway, have a nice weekend. The Destruction of the Traditional Roman Rite by Michael Davies During the first session of the Second Vatican Council, in the debate on the litur liturgy constitution, Cardinal Alfredo Ottaviani asked, are these fathers planning a revolution? The cardinal was old and partially blind. He spoke from the heart, without a text about a subject which moved him deeply, and continued, Are we seeking to stir up wonder, or perhaps scandal among the Christian people, by introducing changes in so venerable a rite, that has been approved for so many centuries and is now so familiar? The rite of Holy Mass should not be treated as if it were a piece of cloth to be refashioned according to the whim of each generation. So concerned was he at the revolutionary potential of the Constitution, and having no prepared text, the elderly cardinal exceeded the ten-minute time limit for speeches. At a signal from Cardinal Al Frank, who was presiding at the session, a technician switched off the microphone, and Cardinal Ottaviani stumbled back to his seat in humiliation. The Council Fathers clapped with glee, and the journalist to whose dictatorship Father Louis Boyer claimed the Council had surrendered itself were even more gleeful when they wrote their reports that night and when they wrote their books at the end of the session. When we laugh, we do not think, and had they not been laughing, at least some of the bishops might have wondered perhaps whether Cardinal Ottaviani had a point. He did indeed. A liturgical revolution had been planned, one which very few of the 3,000 bishops present in St. Peter's would have endorsed had they suspected its true nature. It had been planned before the council, and its manifesto was the preparatory schema on the liturgy, the draft document for which the bishops would vote after discussing and amending it. The document can properly be termed the Bugnini Manifesto, as it was primarily the work of a Vincentian priest, Father Annabale Bugnini. He managed to secure its approval shortly before being dismissed by Pope John XXIII from his post as Secretary of the Litur Liturgical Preparatory Commission and from his chair at the Lateran University. Bugnini's allies at the Conciliar Lit Liturgy Constitution, who had worked with him on preparing the schema, now had the task of securing its acceptance by the bishops without any substantial alterations. They did so with a degree of success that certainly exceeded the hopes of their wildest dreams. They presumed that the bishops would be a bunch of useful idiots, men who preferred to laugh rather than think. It was all good fun, wrote Archbishop R.J. Dwyer, one of the most erudite of the American bishops. And when the vote came around, like wise Sir Joseph Porter, we always voted at our party's call. We never thought of thinking for ourselves at all. The way you can save yourself a whole world of trouble. The late Monsignor Klaus Gamber was described by Cardinal Ratzinger as the one scholar who, among the army of pseudo-liturgists, truly represents the liturgical thinking of the center of the church. As regards the attitude of the Council Fathers, would have taken to the changes that have been foisted upon us in the name of Vatican II, he informs us in his book, The Reform of the Roman Liturgy, that one statement we can make with certainty is that the new order of the Mass that has now emerged would not have been endorsed by the majority of the Council Fathers. Why then did these bishops endorse the liturgical constitution? Archbishop Lefebvre has given us the answer. 
there were time bombs in the council. These time bombs were, of course, ambiguous passages inserted in the official documents by the liberal periati or experts. The answer to Cardinal Ottaviani's question as to whether the council fathers were planning a revolution is that most of the fathers, the 3,000 bishops, most certainly were not, but that some of the most influential periti, the experts who accompanied the bishops to Rome, were definitely planning one. It is not exaggerating in any way to claim that these innovative parati hijacked Pope John's council, a fact which I have documented in great de detail in my book on Vatican II. Douglas Woodruff, one of England's outstanding Catholic scholars, was editor of the tablet during the council. In one of his reports on the council, he remarks, For in a sense, this council has been the council of the Pariti, silent in the aula, but so effective in the commissions and at bishops' ears. This is an exceptionally perceptive comment, and it would be hard to improve on the Council of the Pariti as a one-phrase description of Vatican II. Bishop Lucy of Cork and Ross, Ireland, testified that the Pariti were more powerful than most bishops, even though they had no formal voice, because they had the ear of a cardinal or the head of a national group of bishops, and they were influential in the drafting of council documents. The expert is the person with power. The manner in which the innovative Pariti laid the foundations for their revolution during the first session of the council was spelled out in precise detail by Cardinal John Heenan of Westminster. The subject most fully debated was liturgical reform. It might be more accurate to say that the bishops were under the impression that the liturgy had been fully discussed. In retrospect, it is clear that they were given the opportunity of discussing only general principles. Subsequent changes were more radical than those intended by Pope John and the bishops who passed the decree on the liturgy. His sermon at the end of the first session shows that Pope John did not suspect what was being planned by the liturgical experts. God forbid warned Cardinal Heenan that the Pariti should take control of the commissions established after the council to interpret it for the world, but this is precisely what happened. They had constructed the liturg liturgical constitution as a weapon with which to initiate a revolution, and the council fathers had placed this weapon in the hands of those who had forged it. Archbishop R.J. Dwyer observed, with the benefit of hindsight, that the great mistake of the council fathers was to allow the implementation of the constitution to fall into the hands of men who were either unscrupulous or incompetent. This is the so-called liturgical establishment, a sacred cow, which acts more like a white elephant as it tramples the shards of a shattered liturgy with ponderous abandon. What the experts had been planning was made clear on the 24th of October, 1967, in the Sistine Chapel, when what was described as the Misa Normativa was celebrated before the Synod of Bishops by Father Annabali Bugnini himself, its chief architect. Incredible as it may seem, he had been appointed secretary of the post-Vatican II liturgical commission, and thus had the power to orchestrate the composition of the new rite of mass, which he had envisioned in this schema he had prepared before his dismissal by John the Twenty-Third, and which had been passed virtually unchanged by the Council Fathers. Why Pope Paul VI appointed the man who had been dismissed by his predecessor to this key position is a mystery which will probably never be answered. Less than half the bishops present voiced support in favor of the Misa Normative, but they were ignored with the arrogance which had been, has, which was to become the most evident characteristic of the liturgical establishment, to which the Council Fathers had been naive enough to entrust the implementation of the lit liturgical constitution. The Misa Normativa was imposed on Catholics of the Roman Rite in 1969 as the Novus Ordo Missae, with a few changes, the most important of which was the restoration of the Roman canon on the explicit instructions of Pope Paul VI. Readers of the Remnant will be familiar with its format and its deficiencies, which are documented in great detail in my book, Pope Paul's New Mass. It is the fruit of the Bugnini Schema, and also the great merit of the book under review, which makes it clear that the Bugnini Schema was the fruit of the liturgical movement, the true history of which is now available for us in English for the very first time in the book, The Liturgical Movement, Garinger to Baudun to Bugnini by Father D. Bonaterre. As most Catholics know very little about the liturgical movement, most of what they read in Father Bonaterre's book will come as a complete surprise. Those who know anything of its history will be aware that it was endorsed by the pre-Vatican II popes and may be surprised at the strength of Father Bonaterre's criticism and his insistence that it is the font and origin of the liturgical anarchy which is emptying our churches today. The inescapable conclusion of this book is that the movement, like Vatican II, was taken over by the innovators. One does not need to be a liturgical scholar to know that Dom Prosper Geringer was the greatest of all liturgists, and his principles and his work were fully endorsed by St. Pius X. They can be considered the founders of the liturgical movement. Does the linking of their names of the Archbishop Bugnini via Dom Baudain in the title of this book imply that they must bear some responsibility for the conciliar reform, which Monsignor Gamber has summed up in one devastating sentence?
At this critical juncture, the traditional Roman rite, more than 1,000 years old, has been destroyed. Father Bonaterre refutes this suggestion in the introduction to his book and also makes clear his purpose in writing it. The relationship suggested by such a title may seem rather bold to our reader, but it is not we who see a link between the author of the institution's liturgiques, Dom Garanger, and the gravedigger of the Mass, Annibale Bugnini. It is the Roman authorities themselves. In fact, Pope Paul VI wrote to the Abbot of Solemns on January 20, 1975, I acknowledge the solidity and influence of the work of Dom Garanger, in whom the liturgical movement of today salutes its originator. Already the foreword of the Institutio Generalis of the New Missal claimed that contemporary reforms were the continuation of the work of St. Pius X. The conclusion of the foreword claims that Vatican II brought to completion all the efforts to bring the faithful closer to the liturgy, efforts undertaken through the last four centuries and especially in recent times, thanks to the liturgical zeal shown by St. Pius X and his successors. Thus, and we can give an infinite number of examples, the most advanced liturgists and the conciliar church herself claim that there is continuity and even a homogeneous development in the liturgical movement between Dom Garanger or even St. Pius X and Annibale Bugnini. That is a deception that we cannot accept. That is why we have written this book on the liturgical movement. We will endeavor to show the way in which the movement was diverted from its course. Certainly, historically, Dom Garanger and St. Pius X are truly at the origin of the liturgical movement, but it is false and pernicious to claim that this movement, at least in its contemporary forms, is derived from their thought, or still is that it is the continuation of their work. To expound this thesis, we must study the history of the liturgical movement, acknowledge its magnificent fruits, but also establish from external evidence the early deviations of this grandiose enterprise which could have been brought so much to the church. It is important to note that the fact that the liturgical movement did indeed bring forth magnificent fruits, though rarely so in English-speaking countries, Father Bonaterre insists that his book is not intended to be purely negative. Far from being negative, such a study enables us to discern what we must reject and what we must carefully conserve of the liturgical movement. It is vitally important that, above all, we who work for the maintenance of Catholic liturgy become the heirs and successors of the work of Dom Garanger and St. Pius X. We make the wishes of St. Pius X our own. Father Bonaterre endorses the definition of the liturgical movement given by Dom Oliver Rousseau as the renewal of the fervor for the liturgy among the clergy and the faithful. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the elevation of St. Pius X to the papacy. Traditional Catholics everywhere should be preparing appropriate celebrations. Father Bonaterre writes, In 1903, the person who was to give the movement a definite impetus had just ascended to the See of Peter, St. Pius X. Gifted with an immense pastoral experience, this saintly pope suffered terribly from the decadence of liturgical life, but he knew that a trend for renewal was developing, and he decided to do his utmost to ensure that to bring forth good fruits. That is why on November 22, 1903, he published his famous motu proprio, Trale Solitudini, Restoring Gregorian Chant. In this document, he inserted the vital sentence which went on to play a determining role in the evolution of the liturgical movement. Our keen desire being that the true Christian spirit may once more flourish, cost what it may, and be maintained among all the faithful, we deem it necessary to provide aught else for the sanctity and dignity of the temple, in which the faithful assemble for no other object than that of acquiring the spirit from its primary and indispensable source, which is the active participation in the most holy mysteries and in the public and solemn prayer of the Church. See Trale Solitudini, November 22, 1903. For St. Pius X, as for Dom Garanger, writes Father Bounatar, the liturgy is essentially theocentric. It is the worship of God rather than for the teaching of the faithful. Nevertheless, this great pastor underlined an important aspect of the liturgy. It's, it is educative of the true Christian spirit. But let us stress that this function of the liturgy is only secondary. The tragedy of the liturgical movement was that it would make this secondary aspect of the liturgy the primary aspect, as is made manifest today in any typical parish celebration of the new Mass. Father Bonaterre has nothing but praise for initial stages of the movement. Born of Dom Garanger's genius and the indomitable energy of St. Pius X, the movement at this time brought magnificent fruits of spiritual renewal. If there is a villain of the book, he is Dom Lambert Baudin, but Father Bonaterre has no hesitation in paying tribute to the great contribution that he made to the movement in its early years. The merit of having understood all that could be learned from the teaching of St. Pius X falls to Dom Lambert Baudin. Alas, this monk was unable to maintain throughout his life this hierarchy of the ends of the liturgy, i.e., worship first, teaching second, as we shall see in the course of the study, but let us not anticipate. Dom Lambert Bodine at, at first was a priest of the Diocese of Liege, a worker's missionary under Pope Paul, uh, Leo XIII. 
1906, at the age of 33, he entered the Abbey of Mont Césaire, which had been founded by the monks of Marcedou at Louvain a few years earlier. Because of his previous activity among the secular clergy, his mind had become habitually occupied by the problems of the apostolate and pastoral work, and so he viewed the liturgy in light of his habitual preoccupations. Very speedily he discovered in the liturgy, following St. Pius X, a wonderful method of the for forming the faithful in the Christian life. In 1909, he launched a liturgical movement at Mont Cesar, which was an immediate success. It is important to see the liturgical movement within the context of the modernist crisis, which is documented in my book, Partisans of Error. Father Bonaterre writes, Crushed by St. Pius X, the modernists understood that they could not penetrate the church by theology, that is, by a clear expose of their doctrines. They had recourse to the Marxist notion of praxis, having understood that the church could become modernist through action, especially through the sacred action of the liturgy. Revolutions always use the living energies of the organism itself, taking control of them little by little and finally using them to destroy the body under attack. It is a well-known process of the Trojan horse. The liturgical movement of Dom Garanger, of St. Pius X, and of the Belgian monasteries, in origin at any rate, was a considerable force in the church, a prodigious means of spiritual rejuvenation, which, moreover, brought forth good fruits. The liturgical movement was thus the ideal Trojan horse for the modernist revolution. It was easy for all the revolutionaries to hide themselves in the belly of such a large carcass. Before Mediator Day, who among the Catholic hierarchy was concerned about liturgy, what vigilance was applied to detecting this particularly subtle form of practical modernism? It was from the 1920s onward that it became clear that the liturgical movement had been diverted from its original admirable aims. Dom Boudin, first of all, favored in an exaggerated way the teaching and preaching aspect of the liturgy, and then conceived the idea of making it serve the ecumenical movement to which he was devoted body and soul. Dom Pache tied the movement to biblical renewal. Dom Cazelle made it the vehicle of a fanatical antiquarianism of a completely personal conception of the quote-unquote Christian mystery. These first figures were largely overtaken by the generation of the new liturgists of the various preconciliar liturgical commissions. This new generation is described by Father Bonaterra as the young wolves. In any revolution, it is almost routine for the first moderate revolutionaries to be replaced or even eradicated by more radical ones, as was the case with the Russian Revolution when the Mensheviks were ousted by the Bolsheviks. Faced by the successive acceleration of the movement, Dom Boudin was frightened. We witnessed here the first phenomena of the permanent excesses, a feature of all revolutions. Yesterday's managers are overtaken by today's agitators. The first revolutionaries are taken overtaken by today's agitators. Just as nothing could prevent the rise of power of the Bolsheviks, nothing could prevent the triumph of the young wolves. After the Second World War, the movement became a force that nothing could stop. Protected from on high by eminent prelates, the new liturgists took control little by little of the Commission for Reform of the Liturgy, founded by Pius XII, and influenced the reforms devised by this commission at the end of the pontificate of Pius XII and at the beginning of that of John XXIII. Already masters, thanks to the Pope of the Preconciliar Liturgical Commission, the new liturgists got the fathers of the council to accept a self-contradictory and ambiguous document, the Constitution Sacrosanctum Concilium. Pope Paul VI, Cardinal Lucaro, and Father Bugnini, themselves very active members of the Italian liturgical movement, directed the efforts of the Concilium, which culminated in the promulgation of the new Mass. How could Pope Pius XII, the pastor Angelicus, the most scholarly Pope of the century, and one whose orthodoxy could not possibly be questioned, have allowed the young wolves of the liturgical movement to consolidate their power during his pontificate? Va Father Bonaterre makes it clear that this saintly pontiff was well aware of the subversive elements within the liturgical movement. In his encyclical Mediatra Day, perhaps the most sublime exposition of the true nature of the Mass ever to be written, Pope Pius wrote, We observe that certain people are too fond of novelty and go astray from the oaths of sound doctrine and prudence. They sullied this sa sacred cause with errors, errors which affect the Catholic faith and ascetical teaching. Father Bonaterre insists that, alas, Pope Pius XII did not know the true position of the liturgical movement. Its most dangerous leaders were being supported and protected by the highest dignitaries of the Church. How could the Pope have suspected that the experts, who were so highly praised by Cardinals Bea and Lacara, were in fact the most dangerous enemies of the Church? He laments the fact that thus Pius XII gave the most inopportune encouragement to the Congress at Assisi. The liturgical movement is like an indication of the plans of divine providence for the present time, like the wind of the Holy Ghost blowing through the Church, bringing men closer to the mysteries of the faith and of the treasures of grace, which flow from the active participation of the faithful in the life of the liturgy. Father Bonaterre comments, This declaration could have been true and timely before 1920. In 1956, it was no longer so. In the intervening years, the liturgical movement had denied its origins and abandoned the principles laid down by Dom Garanger and St. Pius X. 
The most influential of the new liturgists, the great architect of the post-Vatican II liturgical revolution, was Father Annabali Bugnini. Father Bonaterra recounts a visit by Father Bugnini to a liturgical convention held at Tulen near Chartres, at which 40 religious superiors and seminary rectors were present, making clear the extent of the influence of the liturgical Bolsheviks on the church establishment in France. He cites a Father Duplay as stating, some days before the reunion at Tulin, I had visited from an Italian Lazarist, Father Bugnini, who had asked me to obtain an invitation for him. The father listened very attentively without saying a word for four days. During a return journey to Paris, as the train passing along the Swiss lake at Versailles, he said to me, I admire what you are doing, but the greatest service I can render you is to never say a word in Rome about all that I have just heard. Bonaterre comments, This revealing text shows us one of the first appearances of the gravedigger of the Mass, a revolutionary more clever than the others, he who killed the Catholic liturgy before disappearing from the official scene. So it was at this date that the counter-church completely pervaded the liturgical movement. Until then it had been occupied by the modernist and ecumenical forces. After the war, it was rotten enough for the stonecutters to take direct control of the reins. Satan got into the Trojan horse. The reference to stonecuttery is based on the fact that in 1975, Pope Paul VI removed Bugnini, an archbishop by then, from his position as secretary of the Sacred Congregation for Divine Worship and the Sacraments, dissolved the entire congregation, and in 1976 exiled him as nuncio to Iran. Pope Paul did this because he had been given documentation, which convinced him that the archbishop was in fact a member of the stonecutters. Bugnini denied that he was such, but accepted that he was dismissed because the pope believed him to be a member of that brotherhood. All the relevant documentation is contained in chapter 24 of my book, Pope Paul's New Mass. Father Bonaterre explains that, although the reforms of Pius XII had given some satisfaction to the leaders of the movement, the implacable orthodoxy that the Pope had maintained throughout had not been to their taste. New and more daring reforms were called for, and they needed a Pope who understood the problem of ecumenism and who was wholeheartedly a supporter of the movement. He claims that the news of the death of the angelic pastor was received with almost delirious joy by the deviated liturgical movement. The aged Don Lambert Boudin had not the least doubt as to the cardinal he hoped would be elected, and confided his hopes to, his, to Father Bouillet. If they elect Roncalli, he said, all will be saved. He will be capable of calling a council and canonizing ecumenism. Silence fell, then, with the return of his old mischievousness, he said with flashing eyes, I believe we have a good chance. Most of the cardinals are not sure what to do. They are capable of supporting him. Father Bonaterre comments, To consecrate ecumenism, yes, indeed, but also to consecrate the liturgical movement. Such would be the task of the long-awaited council. For more than 40 years, the new lit liturgists had been spreading their errors. They had succeeded in influencing a considerable portion of the Catholic hierarchy, and they had won some encouraging reforms from the Holy See. All this patient underground work was about to bear fruit. The liturgical revolutionaries took advantage of the constitution on the liturgy to get their ideas accepted. Then, when they were appointed members of the concilium, they only had to draw the extreme conclusions from the principles of Vatican II. Father Bonaterre insists that the new rite carries on its turn all the errors which have come forth since the beginning of the deviations of the movement. This rite is ecumenical, antiquarian, community-based, democratic, and almost totally desacralized. It also echoes the theological deviations of the modernists and the Protestants, toning down the sense of the real presence and diminution of the ministerial role of the priesthood, of the sacrificial nature of the Mass, and especially of its propitiatory character. The Eucharist becomes much more a communal love feast than the renewal of the sacrifice of the cross. It is thus with the new Mass that the liturgical movement, which had started so well, ended so badly. The 1959 Liturgy of the Protestant Thais Community is printed as an appendix to the book and shows some disturbing similarities to the new Mass. Father Bonaterre does not, however, refer to the alarming correspondence of the changes, principally omissions made to the new Order of the Mass in the Missal of St. Pius V in the concoction of the Order of the Mass in the 1970 Missal, and the almost identical omissions from the Sarum Missal made by Thomas Cramner in concocting his 1549 Communion Services. These are documented in great detail in my book, Pope Paul's New Mass. Nor does he refer to the equally alarming correspondence between the liturgical principles permeating the Mass of Paul VI and those of the pseudo-synod of Pistoia condemned as pernicious by Pope Pius VI in his encyclical Octorum Fide of 1794. I would also say that in places, Father Bonaterre seems to presume that the rite of Mass concocted by Father Bugnini's Concilium represents what the leading members of the liturgical movement were aiming at. This might be true in the case of the young wolves who took over the movement, but it's certainly not true of priests such as Boudin, Cassel, Parsh, or Boyer. 
The principal aim of these men was to use the existing liturgy to achieve their pastoral aims and not to impose a radical reform which made the liturgy that they knew, loved, and celebrated daily unrecognizable. In fairness of Father Bonaterre, he does state that the leading figures of the original movement were frightened by the thinking of the young wolves. I have quoted him to this effect in this review. I would, it would have been useful had he quoted the reaction of a priest such as Father Louis Bouillet whom he cites often, to the actual reform that has been foisted upon us. He stated in 1969 that we must speak plainly. There is practically no liturgy worthy of the name today in the Catholic Church. And perhaps in no other area is there a greater distance and even formal opposition between what the Council worked out and what we actually have, and that in practice those who took it upon themselves to apply the Council's directives uh, on this point have turned their backs deliberately on what Boudin, Cassell, and Pius Parsh had set out to do and to which I have tried vainly to add some small contributions of my own. In 1975, Father Bouillet stated, The Catholic liturgy has been overthrown under the pretext of rendering it more acceptable to the secularized masses, but in reality to conform it with the buffooneries that the religious orders were induced to impose, whether they liked it or not, upon the other clergy. We do not have to wait for the results. A sudden decline in religious practice, varying between 20 and 40 percent among those who were practicing Catholics, those who are not have not displayed a trace of interest in the pseudo-missionary liturgy, particularly the young whom they have deluded themselves into thinking that they would win over with their clowning. The value of Father Bonaterre's book would have been enhanced considerably had he been asked to adapt and update it by researching the wealth of documentation published since he wrote it in 1980, the most important item in this respect being the posthumous post memoirs of Archbishop Bugnini, which provide the most valuable source available for researching the actual concoction of Pope Paul's new Mass. There are frequent references in this book to figures included in that of Father Bonaterre, and to many of the experts who are not. One of these, Father Joseph Gellinou, is described by Archbishop Bugnini as one of the great masters of the international liturgical world. This great master tells us with commendable honesty, but no, not a trace of regret, quote, Let those who, like myself, I have known and sung a Latin Gregorian high mass remember if they can. Let them compare it with the mass that we now have. Not only the words, but the melodies and some of the gestures are different. To tell the truth, it is a different liturgy of the mass. This needs to be said without ambiguity. The Roman rite as we knew it no longer exists. It has been destroyed. End quote. Despite these reservations, the liturgical movement Garanger to Baudin to Bugnini is a book which Monsignor Gambert's reform of the Roman rite no Catholic can afford to be without if he wishes to understand the post-Vatican II liturgical revolution. It is profusely illustrated and has an excellent index. Let me know what you thought of that. That was an actual book review, but in so doing, I, by presenting it, I hope I showed you that a book review of this kind can be very informative for those of us who are still trying to wrap our heads around these sort of topics, the change of the Mass, and how different the Mass is. There was a study recently published, and I wish I had a link to it, that showed that only 7% of the preconciliar liturgy, the traditional Latin Mass as we call it, survived into the new, into the new Mass. 7%. Not the 13% we often hear, or the 30% that they claim. 7%. <laughs> it is a new rite of Mass. And Michael Davis spent his life trying to make this point to people that, you know, that much of the woes of the church today come from this. So if you'd like, I will see if I could put a link to that book, maybe in my sources blog that, uh, that uh, Michael Davies was reviewing. Um, I do recommend his book, Pope Paul's New Mass. It, Angelus Press right now has it for around $70 or $80 in a three-volume set of his um, works on the liturgy. I Anybody who's interested in this cannot be, be without those books. Anyway, I hope you found that useful. As always, pray for the Church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.